About three weeks ago, while I was still in Maui, my brother and I and Jim and Randy were looking through some old photographs and it brought back a lot of memories, especially to my brother and I. And my, my children had a great sense of interest in the old things and the heritage of their families. So I thought, well, what a crime for me to pass out of a picture and just walk out the door and, and not leave anything, at least what I could tell, for, the, for, the, for those who are left behind. So I, I became obsessed with the thought of doing something of this nature. And uh, I, I, I got to work, and I was going to write it, write it first, but I found that writing it would be impossible under my present situation, so it was suggested that I use a, a tape recorder. Well, it hasn't been easy to get set up, but finally I think I'm pretty well set up so I can start it at least. Uh, when I first started, I was going to call it a biography. It soon became apparent after I got thinking about it that a biography is not the right name for it. It's more of the story of a family. Truly, that's what it is. It covers the lifespan of my father, me, Katie Coon, from his birth date as September 9, 1866, to January 6, 1947. And we're going to be talking about what happened between when he was born and later. Maid Katie Coon was born in the Sod Shanty out on the prairie near Albert Lee, Minnesota. A little oh a little Mead was not born with a spoon silver spoon in his mouth. No, he was born in a very poor family, the family that loved him. He came and joined two brothers. One, Austin and Franklin. Franklin was the oldest and Austin was younger. And our sister, Nan. Now, I believe there are other children, but I never became acquainted with them or heard much about them or hardly anything about them, so I can't tell you that. And uh, living in, in, in an environment in those days was not an easy life, I'll tell you that. They lived in a sod shanty. Now, they didn't make a sod shanty. I might say that the, the pioneers coming west many times reached the destination, or at least to fish for the winter. And they had to make some provision for the, for the winter that was coming down fast. They couldn't buy lumber, and uh, building a log house was something else. But they could build a sod shanty. Now, the plow is cut a furrow about a foot wide, and then go to six inches or eight inches deep, usually six inches deep. So they take this, this oh, oh, turf and lay down and build up like, like a bunch of bricks. And pretty soon they had a wall, a wood wall that kept them warm in the winter time and cool in the summer. They had a dirt earth floor, but it was packed hard and it was kept clean. And, uh, they had to put a few windows in and a fireplace in one end. Well, then they were there in protection for the winter. So that's where we find little, little Albert, not little Albert, but little me, Katie Coon, at this facing time. Tragedies, tragedy struck the family, and particularly me. His cousin dropped him off the porch, and he just located his hip in some way. I never quite determined just what happened, but in those days there were no doctors and those that were didn't know what to do. So he just grew up with that leg about two inches shorter dangling as he was going along. It wasn't entirely useless, but it wasn't a great benefit. It was a good benefit, yes, but it wasn't it wasn't much of a leg. But it got him around. When he was young, the children had to carry on and do their part of the, of the work around the pro property. They would carry their own weight. And back in those days, there was lots of things to do. This was, remember, back in back in Indian Territory. They were in Indian Territory. 
and they were subject to all kinds of things happening. Indian wars, they'd go on the war path and come up and raid their people to the houses. But if they had a friendly Indian somewhere in their country, they'd come and tell them, they'd say, there's going to be a war path. There are Indians on the war path, and they're going to make a raid, so get out. So at this particular time, an Indian came to an old Indian chief, and he says, go, go, Indian war path. So Grandma Coon grabbed her old musket and pumped it full of modern and lead and powder and whatnot and took to the cornfield. Her father, her husband, took his rifle and went out on the, to the port close to the, before we the, the, the creek. Well, there she sat all night long. And that wasn't until the, the gray mist of dawn broke that she could just make out little figures here and there, possibly. And in the, in the what she saw was, looked like a, surely it was an Indian. And she watched it for a few minutes, and finally she drew up and drew a bead on that head, and it turned just at that moment. And it was her husband. She fainted dead away. Anyway, that was an experience she had. She went through, and it was quite, quite an experience. I thought, thought you'd like to hear it. Grandmother and grandfather were true pioneers. Grandfather was a big man and husky. Grandmother was not a was not a big person, but she was had wiry and she had a lot of determination. She was Scotch and Irish. Granddad Coon, he, he was a woodcutter, and especially in the winter time when he couldn't run his farm, he'd cut wood and make money. And one night, almost every night when he came home, he'd bring along a big chunk of wood for the for the head head headstone of the or the backlog of the fire fireplace, which was doing that night. He had a big of wood on his, on his over his shoulder, and another one, the axe put into it on the side, and he slipped and fell, and would you know it, the Lord came right down on his neck, and that put him completely out of business. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Here this little family getting started, and the father being absolutely immobile, and it lasted for 30 years. Well, and it was a break for life. And, but they had to carry on. But they had the little ranch there. I don't know how much it involved in but I know they had horses and cattle and, and this and that. And they found that the little me could handle the plow, believe it or not. But he'd hang on to the plow and again drag him along behind the plow. And, um, and he could plow that way. It looked like a little frog running up the road, and so they called him Froggy. And that wasn't a derogatory name, that was a little, that was a little pet name they had for him, they called him Froggy. So he remember that name for a long time. And then they found out that he uh, could herd cattle. They had his cattle had to be herded, somebody had to take care of the stock. They'd put him up on the horse, and the way he'd go, he'd be there all day long, taking care of his cattle. And he became a very herding horseman. In those days, being a horseman was something to be looked up to. And it's just like being a fine boat handler nowadays. And uh, so, he became a fine horseman. And back in those days, horses were supreme. They were the king of the road. Well, time went on, and they were situated between quite a few different There were the Irishmen and the Scotchmen and the you know, no Norwegians and no Germans and no you name it, quotes. And it, it was a difficult time to get down sometimes because the, the hooligans had come out and give them a bad time. Because you hear a little, little need on a, on the horse. His brothers were there too as a rule. And, but, but Mead, he had a nation of whole. He was quick and grease lightning, and he wasn't afraid of the face of clay, he used to say. And so, during the town one day, they all surrounded him and challenged him. And at the right moment, he just exploded. He just exploded, and those guys fled, and those that were on the ground, those guys fled as fast as they could go, and it's the last time they bothered the little, little me, because he's established himself with the as a fighter. 
but he didn't want that kind of fire and energy. So, uh, but when he went down through his life, much of the time he had to fight his way out of a situation. He was never afraid. He had advantage the fact that he was he was um, small, probably weighed 150 pounds, and a bit crippled. I didn't expect anything from him. He came as a complete surprise. The most always come out on top. Anyway, that's those things he had to had to put up with during life. Now I know that the Coon family didn't have much education. But they wanted to have. I know they had a little bit of school in the wintertime, maybe a month or two. I remember my father telling a story about his brother Austin. Austin was giving the teacher a bit of a bit of problems. So the teacher says, Austin, you come over here and sit down and when that mouse comes out of that hole, you grab him. So the little Austin went over there and sat down and about two minutes later he said, I got the little cuss. Sure enough, he had a little mouse for the, for the head. So he was a fun little guy himself. So I didn't know he had some education. But that was the total of it. Now somewhere along the line he gravitated. Uh, they're dealing in horses and cattle. Thus we put him instead to do to do a lot of horse trading and cattle trading and that sort of thing. So they decided to take a trip west. Mead and Frank and Austin. Make a trip west to the far west. To out on Nez Perce country. Clear out to the to the Salt Lake City area, all through that kind of weather in northern northern Idaho. Beautiful country, just beautiful, un, un, unspoiled. And they went out there, and on their way, they stopped at a, at a, at a ranch. There are a few ranches along the way, and uh, there was an Adventist family named Star at a ranch. And of course, they wanted to stop at that place briefly because there's was their friends and they could be their friends and, and they had a wonderful family of boys and girls who about their age. And they heard that they had a gal in their family who was a tremendous bread breaker. She bought the finest bread in the country. And you know those okay. days you looked as much as you could do more than what you look like. And mom could I said mom she'd be exactly I'll tell you later. Oh this gal, Ada May Star Oh, this girl that makes the bread. Oh, she sure baked bread for them when they left his money with a sack of bread. And away they went to the west. They got out there where the Indians were, and the horses, just living a free, beautiful, free life. And they, they bargained with the Indians. Now, they, they couldn't talk any Indians, but the boy, especially, especially Dad, well, I'm Dad, he's my father, especially me, he, he picked up a language very fast. And he had taken off of enough language so he could uh, sign language and talk language so he could get by. I remember one of the, one of the words they used to use a lot was in the wood to six. In the wood to six, we used to get play, play horses and run the Indians, and that was the word that was used a lot. Now, when my father was younger, early in his younger days, he farmed out at some some farm to a, to a rancher nearby. He got him 50 cents a day, and of course the man fed him. And uh, besides that, he he was a he was a very astute old German. He taught the boy how to read and how to write German. And, and he was a ready student. He had a brilliant mind. So he learned there that winter to speak and talk German. And also he picked up. Norwegian, so he could talk better Norwegian and a smattering of other things. So it, it, it put him in good stead when he had to learn a little bit of the, of the Indian language because he was a fast learner. Well, they bought a big herd of horses and headed back east. Imagine riding horses and out in the open like that. Must have had a wonderful, wonderful experience. There's game everywhere, deer and all kinds of things. Well, on the way back, we stopped at the Star Ranch again, and my pappy took a shine on this gal, and I don't know if he got engaged to her at that time, but he, I know he had some serious plans. And eventually he did marry her, and she, she became my mother. 
Well, we finally got back to Michigan, and I remember my father saying about the 57 days in the saddle. It's quite a long time, isn't it? It was a wonderful trip and a wonderful experience. I just, old me just grew up in that trip, really. And uh, he proved his worth as a horseman and as a, a leader, too, really. Well, they got back to the Michigan, put them in the corral, and then they broke the horses and they sold them. And they had a ready market, because those horses were beautiful horses. They were beautifully marked and they were just they were real ready to go. And so that's what they did. Now, I'll be on there, I don't know what had happened right quick. But I do know that they gravitated over towards, towards Battle Creek. Now, Battle Creek was the headquarters of the Adventist denomination at that time. They had a sanitarium there, and, a, and they had a school. And uh, I know my father wanted to learn so badly, he wanted education. So he, he got, he managed to get to school there for one winter. Now he had no money when he went there to speak of. And so he had to work his way through. He would get up at two o'clock in the morning and clean the, clean the school rooms. And the time school was ready, he was ready to go too. And Sundays he washed his clothes, two shirts hung up to dry. But it wasn't easy. And uh, at first the kids were kidding him, but they didn't kill him for long. There was a Jewish man in the community, his name Strauss, a very kindly old man, and he took a shine to, to me. He said, listen, young fellow, he says, go over and help me a little bit. So he did that. And, and a little later he said, say, let me help you some more. I'm going to make up some packages of pins and needles, and you can take them out and sell them to the ladies in the community. But she did, and he did very well. Partially because they needed the pins and needles, not in a little bit, because he had a young fellow with a little bit of cripple ways, who was willing to get out and beat the pavement to make a dime. Well, they, they sold for a little bit of money, but it, it paid off. Because later, in later years, not many later years, but a little bit later, the old man Strauss picked up a wagon with a store. And they had everything from soup to nuts. And started out and they had pots and pans and they had old, uh, old materials and anything a woman would want. They had some of the board. And so he went out and he did real well. And he'd stop at a farmer's house at night and they'd put him up for the night to feed his, feed his horses. And he'd eat dinner with the family and they'd have a nice conversation. He always leaves the lady something in the morning for a present, and uh, got along very well. And he, tells, he used to tell us stories about what happened. It was about one night, he they were at a place with an Norwegian family, and there's some three or four vivacious young gals there, and they were really excited. They had new men in, in their house, and they didn't see a lot of new guys around there, and uh, they were really had a, they were really chattering. But there were same things he wouldn't say had they known that he was listening. He didn't say anything. He listened, didn't listen. Until the proper time. Then he asked a few questions. But those girls got out of there so fast, they couldn't get out there fast enough. I thought their faces were red. Anyway, they had a good laugh over that. Well, then we find Father Coon. I mean, not Father Coon, but it was his again. But he going to school at Walla Walla College. Now, he wasn't a college student, but he was of Walla Walla College. That's what it was. But he was a student in there and teaching him at whatever level they could explore. And, um, and I remember my father was a quizzer at, at, at mathematics. He could do it in his head, but mostly I took uh, several minutes to do on paper. He was sharp. Sorry about that. It was at a time when, well, as I was saying, Battle Creek was really the Jerusalem for the Adventist people at that time. Everything centered around around Battle Creek, and uh, Battle Creek College was there, the big sanitarium was there, Liberty Cake Kellogg, the little Kellogg. Well, that was John Kellogg, he was a surgeon there, a big man in the denomination, and elsewhere, I guess. 
Um, so everything gravitated to the Battle Creek. Well, my dad spent a year there, at least most of the year, and then he had to go home. And during that year, he, he became acquainted with Kellogg. At least Kellogg got his eye on him. And he offered him the opportunity to stay there and be trained as a medical doctor. So what an opportunity that was. What an opportunity. And when he got home, his two brothers said, Made you can't do that. Somebody's got to run the farm. Who's going to run the farm? Somebody's got to run the farm. So they prevailed on to stay home. And that was a terrible thing, a terrible waste of life. So we find little meat. There wasn't little meat anymore. We find meat back on the farm. But not for long. Somehow they made arrangements for the, for the family. And they never, they never, you know, want to say. They always took the best care of, of, of Granddad Coon. I didn't know he was. But St. Vitus dancing couldn't walk, couldn't go anywhere. He always had the best of everything. And somehow they took him along with him wherever they went. And he always got the best. They always say, Grandpa Coon got the best of everything. Well, he deserved this poor man. Well, he didn't stay on the farm very long, but he wanted to do things. He wanted to get moving. And uh, what can he do? Well, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. He, I found that he had a, he bought a, a, a very African oh, lantern and for you to put a slide in and show pictures on the screen. So he got a lot of different st stories like trips to the Yellowstone and trips to the Grand Canyon and all those things. And he'd go to, to, to a little community and arrange to use their, their school at Saturday night. He'd put a podium on, do a packed house so if they never had anything else to do. So he did real well with that. That was one of the things he did real well. The Coon brothers were not idle. Somehow they got into, involved in a, in a manufacturing process, making washing machines. Now washing machines in those days weren't developed in any particular ease of operation or even quality. So they had several models on the market. But this model was uh, something different than anything that had anything had been put out before. They called it a cyclone washer. It was built like a big like a big tank, four foot square tank and about eighteen inches wide. And uh, it's not even four well not quite ten maybe forty inches high. Anyway, it had baffles on the inside and, and had rockers on the bottom and when the clothes were in this washing machine it was rocked up, a rocket like a rocking chair, and it was closed and slide back and forth and slush and slush and slush. And the baffles would release air, and it would be like having an air drift come into the, into the washing machine and on the clothes. And they did a wonderful job of washing clothes, and it was simple to use, and the kids liked to wash it. The kids were over the arguing who could do the, do the washing. I remember many of the days I'd sit on top of that washing machine and rode like a buck and bronco. And that was fun. So they just started in this. And they were very successful. And uh, somebody had to get out and sell the product. And so it became the job of me. Me too became to do so. Because he was a natural born salesman. He covered the North Southwest and the Central States and all down through Texas and all around. He covered a lot of territory. I don't know how much territory he did cover. I know in that area I mentioned. And he had robots. And he had he had that orders coming in from everywhere. And they were shipping out washing machines all over the United States and into Africa. Well, that was great. It seems, I guess, probably before he came into this business, he somehow got his little girl down there in North Dakota and made her his wife. And it was Ada May. And, uh, he lived, she lived in in, in uh, Battle Creek. I should have brought her in the picture a little sooner. But she's here already. And so here we find oh, me out there selling. And uh, started having problems with his back. And he, he had such pain, it, it 
the little buckets and shields and stuff his head. That's what they claim. I don't know how it happened, but oh, the doctor said, oh, you've got to quit traveling. You've got to take a different kind of life. Get yourself a covered wagon and, and, and take it easy for a couple of years. You'll be all right. How stupid could they be? There he was, working at death's door. They put him out there wrangling horses and he was riding bucking horses and all kinds of things. And he'd been much better off to stay home. Well, one time, very soon after that, he got a he got a terrible attack. So I died and they got him on the train and moved him back to Battle Creek. Well, they moved him right into the operating room, cut him open and they probed his kidney. Eleven times before they found the, the, the kidney stone, they cut it out. But that time he's so bad, badly gone, and they didn't expect he'd live, and they never even put a drain in him. Well, that's what it was in those days. They put him off in a cot in one of the rooms and he died. But there was a young intern there. His name was Alan, if I remember right. And he took a shine to my dad. And he gave him absolute attention. I remember Dad told about his experiences there. He said he did, well, the first place they left him alone and not attended. He found a great poodle, poodle blood under his bed. So he thought he was just about dead for blood. And he felt himself going down. Down, 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 down. Blow, he was. At that point, he thought he was dead. He just thought it was. He went unconscious and he wasn't alive again for 28 or some, 20 or 29 days. All of a sudden one day he woke up and sat up in bed and here he was surrounded by all these celestial beings and in white, he thought he was in heaven. What a disappointment to find his back here on earth again. But one of the, one of the help there made, made a, a cripple of some kind and it, it kind of bothered him. He, he was like a young fella. If you don't behave yourself, I'll knock you up into a cocked hat and I'll knock the cap off. Well, that really set the, set the tone. Alan never left his side. It was many days before, lingering between life and death. And he finally pulled through. He was a tough old boy. And they used to walk him out on the lawn with the trees here and get sunshine and get more rest. And Eventually, he gradually got back to health again. But by that time, the business had flown the coop. With all the salesmen out there, he didn't sell much product. And the boys weren't able to take toothpaste from salesmen. And besides that, somebody was trying to get control. I don't know the details of this, but somebody was trying to get control of their company. And they got some kind of a deal against him. A, a mortgage, not a mortgage deal, but a some kind of deal where they were going to sell him, sell him out. And they put, they put the notices around the town and so high on the telephone post and nobody could read them. So when it came the day of the sale, nobody was there except those guys. And my brother, my uncle. Well, that put him out of business right now. So they were back to where they started filming. And that was a terrible blow. Because they had a product there that had been good for many, many years, and they've worked in this